right, guys. Thank you so much for coming out. Wow, we got to, I, I thought it would just be the three of us here, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> so, guys, I'm Tim Flores from Levante Brewing Company, and with me I have Greg Harris, our Director of Brewery Operations and our head brewer, and Jim Adams, who is also one of the founders of Levante Brewing Company and our CMO, among many other things. Um, so there were so many familiar things in that movie uh, that it was almost eerily, it was just weird, you know, uh, from the brewing in your, uh, your tiny little apartment to the, you know, wondering if you made the exam or wondering if the guy ever started a brewery. I was like really rooting for him. Uh, and it's great that he's an assistant brewer somewhere. So, uh, but he, so we came out uh, really to talk to you guys about the whole, uh, the whole science of inspiration, which is what our presentation is tonight. And honestly, we, you know, we come out thinking, you know, we're going to have a group of people who wants to hear about us and our history, and I don't know if that is actually the case. What I want to know from you guys is, you know, show of hands, who here is involved in the brewing industry at all? Anybody? Oh, so we have a couple guys. All right, awesome. So about, you know, what, two to four people here involved in the brewing industry. Um, who here is looking to get into the brewing industry? Smart. Another, Okay. <laughs> One person. Oh, God bless you. Uh, no, no, it's great. So that just gives me a great idea. And then who here is just in, uh, who, who is just here because they love beer? All right, awesome. So I know who we're talking to. Two other questions. Who here is more interested in the art of brewing than the science of brewing? Okay. And last question, who here is more interested in the science of brewing than the art? I guess that kind of uh, would, you know, hopefully you're interested in one or the other. All right, so, we, so hopefully we have something good for you tonight. We have, we're going to talk to you about the, uh, like we have up here, the science of inspiration. Um, really, they're, like they said in the movie, there's so, there's so much involved in starting a brewery. It's not just the love of beer. Fortunately and unfortunately, it's the love of business or uh, the ability to deal with uh, the uh, events that arise in business and just in life. But also what keeps you involved, like Sam and Rob and Garrett and all those guys said from all those amazing breweries, is that if you don't love what you do and you're not inspired, you're not going to make it. But you just flat out, you know, you could make it, you could still not make it and be inspired, but you're definitely not going to make it if you're not inspired. So uh, we have a quick presentation for you guys, and then we just really wanted to open it up to questions to you to see what you, what you want to hear from us, uh, being, you know, involved in the brewing industry for, um, you know, what, five to ten years now, bet you know, between us, I guess, what, 30 years of, of brewery experience. Maybe I'm giving us too much. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, uh, so we'll go through it here. And Emily, I have no idea how to work this thing. I guess I just press a button. Press the middle button. Oh. Button on the right. Oh, I'm the man. <laughs> Quick video for you guys just to tell you a little bit about our history and how we do things. Um, and I think I was supposed to signal to our man up there and or woman. I learned about brewing beer, I want to say, uh, right out of college. I think the Levante way is really encapsulated in our slogan here, Elevate Your Craft. I've always had a passion for good quality beer. Um, uh, when I found Levante, I um, knew that something was right. There have been some really unique ingredients that we brewed in beer. Those types of ingredients that you find out there in the world that you're not thinking of brewing at the time really inspire us to uh, create different flavors. It's always exciting to work with a different ingredient because usually we have never worked with it before. So for instance, last summer we used some Earl Grey tea in a beer that had a really traditional 18th century malt base. What inspires us to make a beer could be anything from a customer request in the tap room, or just a totally new idea inspired by an experience we had in life. Once I had um, a book that I read about samurai. So that instantly I was like, I want to make a Japanese samurai inspired beer. So I got into Japanese culture and what they brew with, what they eat on a daily basis, what are some of their customs. It's exciting to work with those kinds of things because you don't really know how a beer is going to turn out. You have to kind of tune into your more artistic side. How do we think these are going to turn out you know, in our imagination before we actually brew that beer? Want to grow responsibly, uh, maintaining quality, uh, and uh, maintaining our relationships that we have right now. 
As much as there's a really laid back atmosphere here when we're off the clock, there's a lot of precision that goes into the beer making process here. There's no cutting corners. It's always about the product and the beer. If there wasn't that aspect of it, I think we, we would not be as successful as we are right now. You know, that we're, we're trying to make the best product that we can that reflects us and who we are. There you have it. That's our mini movie about inspiration. <laughs> I think we can uh, probably move on from that. I'm clearly not a tech technology guy. That's, that's more Jim's department here. Say, uh, right up. There we go. So uh, we, I want to introduce our team here. It's not just the three of us. We have uh, just shy of 50 individuals working directly for us uh, between the brew house, the tap room, other ventures that we have, and also our, our back office. Uh, so we have a huge team that supports us, and it's, uh, it's definitely not just, you know, three of us in the brew house and the office. And uh, you, you see in the, in the movie, uh, there are a lot of brewmasters there, but there are huge teams that support these brewmasters. You know, they can't be writing recipes and ordering ingredients and brewing the beer and doing the accounts payable and all the not-so-fun, not not-so-sexy stuff that, uh, that really is behind a business, which uh, a brewery is first a business. Um, and then it is second, a brewery, fortunately and unfortunately for all of us. Uh, but that's our team. They're beautiful, aren't they? <laughs> and we won that competition. I did. Oh, just backing up right here. That was our uh, holiday party. We were at an axe throwing competition. Someone paid someone to let me win. I don't know who it was, but it felt really good to be the winner for once. <laughs> Uh, but it was a great time. Um, so here, uh, introduction. So my apologies, Jim. We do not have Jim up here because we didn't think he can make it tonight, but he was able to, and he's a crucial part of our organization. So we wanted to have him here to talk about our brand and how we've built it to the amazing place that it is now. But Greg Harris is our, uh, he is our director of brewery operations and our head brewer. He essentially, everything you see that moves at the brewery, everything you, uh, everything you taste, everything that you experience, it had something to do with Greg. Uh, just an amazing person who has a knack for the culinary world and uh, uh, taking inspiration from food, wine, beer, anywhere in the world, music, and turning it into a culinary experience and putting it into a glass for you to try. And so uh, Greg's an amazing person. Wouldn't be able to do it without him. And then Jim here. I don't have to introduce myself because I think Emily did a great job. Thank you. Uh, but so Jim actually was uh, with us from nearly the beginning of our brewery venture. Uh, I don't know if you saw, but the um, one individual was his name Andrew, Drew, Drew's Brews. Yeah, Andrew. Yeah. He went and he he met with the investor, and the investor said, you know, your business plan has some holes in it. I would invest in you, but your business plan kind of sucks. Well, that was Jim with me. <laughs> he said, your beers are great, and I would invest in you. Your business plan kind of sucks, so why don't I come on board and help you grow the brand? And yeah, sure, I'll invest a couple dollars I in you. That wasn't that harsh. <laughs> Uh, essentially, that's how it went. That's how I remember it. Um, but so you have the three of us here. Uh, we're only three of 50 who are responsible for running the company. But um, we're happy to kind of run you through our history and also uh, a little bit about what makes us us and what inspires us. And uh, so here we have the, uh, the science of inspiration product development. So what's, what's big here, and I'll certainly hand over the mic uh, to Greg and to, and to Jim here, but... Uh, the biggest thing that uh, when, we, when we look to create a new beer is we look for inspiration. I'm gonna, you're going to hear that word a lot. It's going to probably get old here. But inspiration is not just uh, I saw something on TV, that's cool, let's brew that. Or I tried something in a restaurant, that's cool, let's brew that. It represents uh, sometimes a 10-week to a, to a two-year process where something sparked your interest. And uh, whether it be a flavor you know, in a restaurant or uh, a wine you drank or a, a be any other beverage or, or food experience or just a song you heard, uh, that could inspire you to make a beer, believe it or not, or inspire you to, um, to create an experience for people to, to come to your brew house or come to your tap room and experience that uh, you know, secondhand. So inspiration is really big for us, and that's why we, we really kind of put that up on a pedestal. Like, we don't just brew a recipe because everyone else is brewing one. Oh, they're putting oats in this nowadays. Uh, so we, we say, okay, why do we want oats in our beer? We want there to be a silky mouthfeel, and we want you to feel and taste 
these oats. You know, a, a small kind of dumb example, but we gather the inspiration and then we go into the recipe formulation phase. That's something I'd love to hand off to Greg because when we talk about inspiration, um, a lot that can come from anywhere. A brewer, a tap room member, someone just calling us and saying, why don't you brew a beer with, uh, you know, schnozberry in it, which we just <laughs> did recently. It doesn't exist. It's a mixture of berries. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but why don't you brew a beer with schnozberries? Well, we can, and this is why, and this is how we turn that inspiration into an actual product. So uh, without further ado, hand it off to Craig. Yeah, I think so much, um, I think they spoke about it a little bit, and, or a lot of it, in the, um, it's so much hard work that goes into it, long hours, that if you're not inspired to do it, then one, you won't do it well, and maybe you just won't do it at all, or you'll stop doing it. Um, you know, that was one thing, you know, I learned very quickly, if you're not, if you're not very passionate about what you're creating, uh, then you, you know, won't do it, or you won't do it safely, or you won't do it well, and uh, in our industry, we just have to do it the best we can, better than hopefully, um, you know, then um, unfortunately sometimes you gotta do it better than others in order to survive like, um, like Tim talks about with business. But, you know, a lot of that comes and the inspiration comes from, you know, needing to have inspiration to drive you through the day. Um, <clears throat> and then also, um, you know, the recipe basically comes out of that inspiration. So like for me, like Tim mentioned, so much of what we do derives around from other sources. So I derive much of mine from travel, food. Tim does a lot from music. Um, you know, I've traveled a lot. You know, I started brewing beers, brewing Belgian beers with my friend who came from St. Andrews over in college and he over in Scotland and he brought back Belgian beers and scotch, and we were hooked instantly, and we couldn't afford them, so we started brewing them. We figured we'd spend the same amount of money, or hopefully less, ended up being more, uh, on, uh, on brewing them ourselves. So, you know, we were just inspired by those flavors, you know, and that initially gave us the inspiration. So, you know, but when it comes, once we have inspiration, you know, from things like that, you know, I was recently in Indonesia, and, you know, one of the... Uh, the mainstays obviously is coffee over there, and they um, they roast all their local coffee in Lombok, which is an island just east of Bali, um, with extra leftover rice and coconut holes. So, you know, I felt that from them. That was a passion that made the product better. I brought that home with me, and we made you know a coffee stout with Indonesian coffee, you know, rice coconut, you know, all those things that give it the same complexities. And again, th those are the things that make it fun, but also ho hopefully tell a story uh, to ourselves and to our customers because we want to engage, you know, our customers and we're really here to, you know, elevate that, you know, kind of um, customer experience as well. Um, recipe formulation on a more, I guess, scientific and less scientific sense is all about, you know, the flavor balance. So for me, you know, I want to, you know, just like with food, you have all those sensories, acid, sweet, salty, you know, you know, you're just trying to balance them to make a perfect dish. I come, I come at recipe formulation in the same sense. So, you know, first we have the inspiration. What are we looking to do? Are we looking to do a, you know, a fruited, you know, IPA, which we make a lot of those. Um, IPAs are great vessels for those, you know, but how are we going to make sure it's balanced? You know, how are we going to balance the hops? and stuff like that. So, you know, it really starts in kind of that symphony of flavors where you're, you know, if you're, you're, if you're gonna go for, let's say, you know, peach, you know, which is an orchard fruit, you know, it's a little muted, you wanna maybe, you know, have some, you know, more tropical flavors, stuff like that. And then all of a sudden you start just building this recipe in your head before it's even on paper. Um, and you kind of have to have that vision, or for me, I, I kind of almost close my eyes when I start thinking about recipes, as funny as it may sound, and I just kind of picture and taste in my mouth what I want it to taste like, and then, you know, I start implying some of those balancing flavors together, uh, hopefully in order to make something that works. And, you know, we put a lot of effort into that, and uh, I've had experience which helps with making good recipes as well. Um, but really it's just, you know, sitting back, you know, creating that, you know, balance between, you know, if you're going to add a sweet flavor like peach or vanilla or lactose, which is unfermentable sugar. So, you know, much of us know that, you know, obviously we're creating sugar uh, from barley, wheat, stuff like that. Um, and then we're fermenting it out into different sweetness levels. 
if we're adding sweetness as well, you know, from lactose, which is unfermentable, sweet, you know, how are we going to make that sharpness? And that's where obviously hops come in to make sure it's not too bitter, not too cloying, stuff like that. And, you know, you just kind of have to balance those flavors. And I always hearken back to cooking, balancing of cocktails in the world, balancing in coffee drinks, tea drinks, stuff like that. And just, you know, making sure, you know, if we're going to create an experience or we're trying to create an experience for ourselves and then for the customer that it kind of, you know, matches as well as possible because, you know, we want it to come out well, you know, as well as we can. So um, ingredient selection, again, I think I touched on that a little bit. Um, but again, there's so many providers out there. You saw the guy taking the Cicerone, which I've never been a part of, but he was smelling all those beers. And that one test that he took in the house was about, was basically those are all German beers. And, you know, to the layman, maybe without looking at the color, they might taste similar. But he's tasting, you know, color, look, smell. And so much of that has to do with the ingredients. So, you know, we have, you know, certain beers, certain things that will, you know, use like a Maris Otter pale ale, an English pale ale, which will give it that sweet, bready, delicious note that we like. Or like a Canadian malt or like a domestic Turo, which would be a little drier, sweet, a little more base, you know, a little more just straightforward. Um, and those are all things that we you know, you focus on, you know, and think about when you're creating the recipe. Um, and I'll, I'll pass it over to uh, Tim here in crafting the product's identity because we talked a lot about that um, in creating the identity. Uh, but, you know, once you kind of have that product, I'm working hand in hand with Tim and the marketing group to design a label and basically the whole feel of the product as we're, you know, pushing it towards market. Thanks, man. Yeah, as Craig says, like I, I tend to feel like when we're designing recipes, and it's much more Craig than myself nowadays. But he almost goes back to these old friends that are, oh, oh, I love this honey malt, and if I could just get 20 pounds of this honey malt into this recipe, 40 pounds of this honey malt, that would give me exactly the flavor that I need to round this this whole flavor profile out. And it's like when you're talking to him, it's like talking to a chef. You know, a, a master chef that's like, oh, and just let me add a little salt and let me add a little bit of this and get some umami in here. You know, I love that term now, umami. Uh, but yeah, so once we have this uh, idea of the beer, uh, this inspiration, and then of course we have the recipe formulation, we now have an idea of what it's going to taste like. Like Greg said, you can almost close your eyes and picture what this is going to look like, smell like, feel in your mouth, as weird as it sounds, uh, but not probably not to beer drinkers, and then taste like. Uh, you'll know the carbonation level that you want it to be with all these flavors and everything. Obviously, it's, there's some, some fine-tuning that we need to do in the process, but then comes the time to give an identity to this beer because like you guys saw in the video, there, uh, you, know, you could put a brown paper bag over a beer, pour it into a glass, and no one will know what the hell it is. You know, it, it tastes great, you know, but I don't know. There's no brand associated with this. So there's no feeling other than the flavor and everything that we spoke about. So the, the, the ultimate rounding out of the entire process for us, other than the experience of physically drinking it, is now a visual identity, a name, uh, just like a person, you know, like a, a, a person with no name comes up to you and just says like, hi, um, okay, who are you? You know, I know you're good looking, you know, I know you're tall, uh, I know you're very nice, you know, you have a long beard, but who are you? You know, what's your name? I mean, where do you come from? And that's what, that's what the product's identity really is. So instead of putting a beer in a blank can and saying, hey, this beer is, we have to do, we have to do something beyond that. And that's, I think there's an art and there's a science in that as well. Uh, and so ultimately, I know we're spending a lot of time on this particular slide, but this is huge. When we craft the product's identity, the name is super important. It has to harken back to that, uh, that inspiration, excuse me, that we got when we initially started talking about the flavors. So you'll see up here, King of Birds, uh, up, in the, up in the right hand side, actually came back from uh, Greg's honeymoon trip to Indonesia, into Southeast Asia, and it was a, a series of beers that were King of Blank. So King of Birds was uh, you know, a certain profile. King of Lombok was the first beer, and that was inspired by the coffee drinks and the flavors that Greg had overseas. So. Um, the, uh, how, we, how we kind of imagined it was the label was actually a civet, or if you're familiar with, uh, uh, what is it, Kopi Luau? Kopi Luwak? It's the coffee that these little civets eat the coffee beans, they poop them out, and then they go and they get the, the poop, and they process that into actual... Uh, coffee beans out of the 
They get the co- uh, so they take the poop off of it. They they get the <laughs> they get the coffee beans out. They grind that up. It's a very expensive coffee. But Greg was apparently drinking that like a king over there in Indonesia. So uh, so we thought, okay, so there should be this civet, you know, this almost like little uh, cat-like creature with a crown on his head with co- and, and the label should look like a coffee bag, like it just came from Indonesia. Um, so we created this label that was reminiscent, almost like very, very closely reminiscent to a coffee bag with a little cat-like civet on it, uh, munching on little poop beans, I guess it is, but uh, <laughs> delicious beer. So you have this whole experience in the name and the, uh, and the, the visual identity of the can of beer, and then when you crack it and you pour it into a glass, you now you see it, you feel it, you taste it, smell it. Uh, and that just, you know, a silly example, but that really rounded out the entire experience. Up there as well, you know, one of our most recent popular beers was DOPE, uh, which is actually uh, an acronym for Doctrine of Phonetic Equivalence, which is something we learned in a meeting with our lawyer, and it inspired us. He said, you can't, you can't trademark something uh, like if there's a product called fat, F-A-T, you can't tra- trademark something called P-H-A-T because it's, it's a phonetic equivalent. We're like, what the hell is a phonetic equivalent? And when he, the words came out of his mouth, I was like, that's a beer name. We should call a beer that. So, so we did, uh, but we called it dope because we found out that that was cool, what he yeah. says. <laughs> so it's these stupid little things that become identities to beers. But when we told our, you know, our marketing crew and our art crew, well, we want to make a dope a dope ass beer. Yep. They were like, well, this is what it's going to look like. Um, and they made that acronym. So uh, that label and visual identity is super important. Um, so uh, just hopping back to Greg, he's going to talk a little bit. Everyone's still interested in what we're talking about, or should we shift gears? Show of hands, who's liking it so far? <laughs> All right, almost everyone. The person way back there doesn't really like no, <laughs> Um So shifting over to Greg because it, he. What goes into the beer is super important, and they didn't show a lot of that technical stuff in the movie, uh, supplier relationships, what ap- actually happens on brew day and fermentation. So we'll, we'll have Greg talk about that on a few minutes, and then we'll uh, hand it over to Jim to talk about some other stuff. Yeah, so, I mean, we'll, we'll touch on a little business. I mean, um, as a growing brewery, you know, we found there are, you know, you're dealing with... Um, commodities, you're dealing with barley, you're dealing with hops, things that as the industry grows, you know, other industries have to grow with it. You know, they're, they're trying to fulfill the needs of an entire growing, massively growing industry. So the supplier relations is, uh, you know, again, on the business side is super important. Going back to, if we want the best hops, the best grain, you know, in this growing market, we have to spend the time with our suppliers. And that's been a, a pleasure because you get to meet new people just like you do in, in the brewing industry and in this business in general. Like, uh, Drew was super happy and I was kind of laughing during the movie because he was super happy about those tastes things with those people because I, I remember those those relations with with those people tasting our beers originally um, and converting them and that's it always pleased me to convert somebody just uh, that resonated with me it was like if that one person if I walk out of here with that one person loving our beer I've made my day and I've always felt that way that you know um, you know maybe some people don't show their colors but you have that one person that provides you that positive affirmation after maybe hours and hours of sitting somewhere but um, I digress but the supplier relationships again are super important as our business grows because again we're you know we have to be profitable in order to continue to make the beer that we hope our customers want and that's one of the biggest relationships we need Um, testing new ingredients goes along with that the supplier relationships help they allow and they push you one to try to sell you new products, but also they want your business to grow. They want you to make better products so you continue to work with them and you can feel that support um, hand in hand. So the testing new ingredients is great. Obviously hops is a big deal for us. You know, I think as beer drinkers, if you guys all drink IPAs and even other styles, you'll see more and more new age hops from all over the world um, being introduced into beers. Uh, we play around, around with a lot of hops, um, new hops, old hops. Um, there's, it's funny that I was just uh, at a collaboration in Icarus in Lakewood, New Jersey, at Icarus Brewing in Lakewood, New Jersey, and he's using Slovenian hops. And I'd heard of them, but I never realized how good they were. And I'm actually really excited to get back and try and order some from Slovenia. Um, but that's kind of part of the process, and it's an ever-growing business, so you kind of have to stay ahead. But also, you know, as you, you're, you're in this and you're making a lot, a lot of beers, 
you have to continue to find things that excite you. And, you know, being that we make a lot of hops because that's what, you know, sells, you know, these new styles and these new hop farmers all around the world are doing funky things, just like the craft beer industry. So they're all taking, they're all having an, their own renaissance in the, uh, you know, the ingredients phase or the raw materials phase. Um, you know, to get a little more of the technical side, the processing raw materials at our brew house, we've moved up in the last couple of years to processing, you know, our barley on a new mill. So we're able to crush it in a finer rate to produce even more consistent beer. I think Garrett Oliver said, you know, you're not basically, you're not a brewer or a professional if you can't replicate. So, you know, it's harder to replicate when you don't have the tools. Luckily, you know, it took us four years, but we have some tools that really make it, you know, super consistent, really dialed in, um, you know, but from the, you know, barley and the wheat and, you know, processing those on the mill. Obviously, I talked about the hops, you know, they're, you know, supposed to be, you know, refrigerated. We utilize them in many different ways, you know, making sure they're sanitary, you know, for dry hopping because we're putting them in post-fermentation, which is susceptible to infection. Um, you know, you got to take a lot of a really good care in that. And then the yeast, obviously, is the major component to all alcohol making in the world. Um, we take a good deal of pride. We have our own QA, QC um, supervisor who oversees all of our yeast management. So he's harvesting beers into basically kegs, half barrel kegs, and uh, cell counting for consistency, cell counting for viability and health. Um, you know, so those are kind of the main ingredients that we use to kind of process, you know, we, that we're processing, I guess, for the beer process. Um, brew day, you know, um, you know, as I've gotten, we've gotten older, I don't do as much of the brew day work. Um, but back when we were, it was a, between me, our manager of brewery operations and, and Tim here, it was a 4 a.m. to 10 p.m. day for the three of us. So, I mean, basically that's obviously starting with, you know, that's a th three batch day for us, which is why it's so long. But, you know, starting with obviously you're processing the ingredients and then you're, you're kind of working in. Um, you know, is everyone familiar with the beer process in general? I mean, I can go through it for sure. Um, you know, essentially I always use the, we all kind of use different methods to explain it. Um, I always kind of take it as tea because it's kind of the most visual for, in my head. You know, making beer visually for me is kind of like tea. We're adding, you know, the first stage is obviously having the barley, wheat, um, stuff like that. And then we're, we're mixing it with hot water. And basically the, you know, sorry, the temperature in which you're, you're mixing those two ingredients creates and converts sugars into fermentable or non-fermentable sugars, kind of hearkening back to the recipe phase. Do we want this beer to be sweeter? Do we want this beer to be drier? You know, the temperature fluctuation that you have when those two first ingredients combine is really important to start that first flavor component. And basically at that point, you're using that barley to, you know, again, going back to the tea analogy, you're pulling out flavor, you're pulling out color, and most importantly for booze, we're pulling out sugar, you know, and then sugar obviously will turn into alcohol further down the line. In that sense, then we move over that sugar water uh, through our mash and louder ton, boiling it, adding all those awesome hops and other spices, adjuncts, ingredients that we want to that make all the fun flavors. And basically we're, we're combining those, chilling that, that wort after about 90 minutes of boiling, chilling it, putting it into a fermenter, combining it with yeast, and that's where the, the fun and the activity happens, where you start to get alcohol. Um, yeah, fermentation, again, kind of touching on it. You know, for us, we're kind of a, a two-week process on our fermentation in total from brew day to package day. Um, primary fermentation basically is that, you know, I think Drew talked about it, that super activity, um, you know, where the majority of your, your sugar that you're intending to get fermented gets fermented. And that usually happens within two, three, four days, really, the primary uh, fermentation. And uh, at that point, you have the majority of your, your alcohol. And, you know, then you start adding potentially with IPAs, dry hops, stuff like that. Um, to start conditioning on, you know, aroma hops, stuff like that. And then you, you know, you're manipulating all the while the most important factor um, is yeast is a temperamental, you know, ingredient. So the hardest part about home brewing is that ye is that temperature control. So I was wondering what I don't. I wonder if he was brewing his pilsner next to his bed, because that would be a difficult task. But you know, with pilsners and lagers, you ferment cold, but you have to maintain cold temperature. Fermentation, 
wants to create heat. You're in that closed environment, you want to create heat. So for us, again, you know, co you know, in the home brewing stage, you know, we took a lot of, we put it in fridges, we used uh, gutter warmers around and threw it in a fridge to maintain the heat up while the fridge was trying to cool it down. Um, but that's a super important uh, component to it, is just maintaining the, the temperature you're looking for for that yeast, for that clean, consistent flavor. And, um, you know, again, then it just kind of cold crash, get all the funky stuff out, and then hopefully off to packaging and, and, and to uh, consumer's consumption there. What do we got next? Uh, so, again, quality, consistency, it's important for us. You know, we're going to make 8,000 or package about 8,000 barrels this year. That's a lot of beer. That's, you know, if you imagine the, the half kegs that you get for your house or you see at bars, that's 16,000 of those. We can a lot, but, you know, if you can visualize, that's a, that's a lot of beer. So we want, and we have one or two main product, three main products with our Cloudy and Cumbersome, which is on tap, and our Tickle Parts IPA. We don't want to be consistent. So we're very, one thing I learned from Tim, and he still pushes me to be better and better at it, um, is keeping the records because if you don't know, you make a great product, you make our cloudy and cumbersome, and you don't have the records to go along with it, that may be a fleeting thing. That thing might be gone in a way if you don't have those records. So we put a lot of time and effort into, you know, we have multiple places. Basically, we have brew day notes, which is very diligent, more diligent than I think I've seen in the industry on the brew day notes. Um, it basically tells a story from the day so we know we can replicate everything. Even if it was something a lot of our guys don't think is important to record, sometimes, and I think they've found that it is important to record. Then we take um, logs of every day during the fermentation stage, the temperature, the, the cell count, or not the cell counts, but the, um, the gravity readings, the pH, um, and basically the external and internal temperature of the beer. And um, we just wanna, again, be able to go back, tell the whole story, also maintain what we intend to maintain with its plan for the beer. And then, uh, you know, once the beer is kind of um, packaged and we've, you know, we've put it in packaging, we've tasted it, then we set up tasting panels. One, to make sure before it goes to the market, it tastes good, it's carbonated, uh, it's cleaned up enough that um, the consumer is gonna get something that they appreciate. And also if it's a, a beer that's returning, that it's um, a replicate of, of what it should have been. And then, um, you know, that's, those tasting panels are important for us just to maintain, again, the history of quality. You know, if we find something three months down the line that's bad, again, we gotta go back to the records and try to figure out what happened. Why did this beer turn, you know, after three months? You know, was it additional oxygen, stuff like that, and packaging? Um, that's what kind of what we're looking for. Never a never, yeah, never a bad beer. Um, yeah, and then we function in the business world like other people. I, I, I probably could say that Tim probably can speak to it a little better than me, but we deal with uh, Department of Agriculture, um, Department of Health, t you know, Tobacco Trade, Tax Bureau, Tax Bureau and, uh, and the what? Fire marshal, township. So it's just we function in a lot of realms there, and as all of our, all the businesses, if any of you own or work for a business, we have to function in that space. And being, you know, rushing, working hard, doing a million things, as some of these brewers I think try to explain, it's it's difficult to to hold up to them. But uh, it's important because uh, you can't get shut down once you start this process. So. Can't stop that train. All right, the science of inspiration, the business. I'm going to ad lib this a little bit. Um, so I wanted to uh, keep it a little interactive here. So who knows what state in this country produces the most beer? You're right, Pennsylvania. There are 366 active breweries in the state of Pennsylvania with 51 coming online in the next 12 months. In Chester County alone, when we started, there were three. It was Sly Fox, Victory, and Levante. Um, actually, four. There was, there was Boxcar in Westchester. Iron Hill as well, but I, I consider them a chain um, and uh, with their roots out of Delaware. But there are now 15 more in Chester County in just the last three years, including those two gentlemen right there. They're from Rebel Hill, right outside of Phoenixville. 
<laughs> um, I've been to your brewery three times. It's fantastic. Please tell Greg we uh, give him our best and our best to you guys. It's, um, it's a very competitive landscape. And Levante is a brewing company, but we're also an experience company. We are a marketing company and we're a technology company. And it's like, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Marketing is incredibly important in this competitive landscape because if I'm considering you all craft beer consumers and beer geeks and just beer lovers, you are bombarded every day on social media with competing content from 366 local breweries in Pennsylvania, 80 something in New Jersey, 57 in Delaware. How do I know all these numbers? I'm not that smart because I track every single one of these breweries 24 seven every day with software that we wrote that is watching every brew, every beer that you're doing, every single one. Why? Because we need to know what the competitive landscape is all the time. We're a technology company. We use statistics behind the scenes to understand what the market wants to do so we can get ahead of it. Um, so it's important. But the, the culture of Levante, you know, how do, we, how do we really kind of frame the culture of the company? And if any of you are Simon Sinek fans, he has a quote that says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Because all these breweries are, what are they, what, you know, what are they doing? They're making beer, we all are. How? We're all doing it the same way almost 80 something percent is practically the same with these little garnishes of individuality and the, and the water chemistry gives you a little bit more of the house effect in yeast. And there, there are things that give you competitive distinctiveness, but it's not that much different from brewery to brewery. So it's the why. Culturally, Chester County is our home and we pride ourselves on being a community driven brewery that gives back to 40 to 60 charities and other philanthropies and nonprofits every year. We've been doing it since the very beginning when we were broke. Um, and you know what? Sometimes we're still broke. You know, it depends. Um, we invest in our culture and in our employees. Uh, we're a small company. We have benefits uh, for, you know, 100% health benefit coverage and, and, and other benefits. And, uh, you know, we just gave, um, you know, pretty substantial pay raise to our part-time employees. And it's important for us to grow that culture deep and not necessarily grow the company out um, or wide. So one of the things we do from a marketing perspective <clears throat> when we're trying to, you know, really express the why that we do things is we deflect away from the brand. You know, there are a lot of breweries out there. That I, I think in the, sh in the uh, movie we saw, they talked about something called the Great American Beer Festival. They call it like the mecca of, of beer. And, and, you know, arguably it may be, and they give awards and it's a big deal. We're not an awards company. Uh, we've earned a bunch of them and we're fortunate and lucky and, uh, and honored to do that. But we deflect away from the brand to the community and try to help others. Uh, an example is this weekend, a lot of breweries have their first, second, third, fourth anniversary party, and they, it's a lot of fun. You come out and you drink and you have a great time. We do the same thing, but why? Ours is called the Hop Party, H-O-P, you know, helping other people, which we ask people to come in, and they can come in for free and party with us as long as they bring five non-perishable food items for the Chester County Food Bank. That's the why. And I think that's the differentiating nature of the brand and the one that I personally am the most proud of. And while I'm a part of this company, while I'm an owner in it, um, and it, you know, it fuels our passion. Um, now, the honest part is I wasn't supposed to get up here and talk tonight. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go off this slide the best I can, but we talked about culture, supporting our talent, um, you know, finance, marketing, the brand, I mean, the brand is a giving culture, like I said earlier. Um, but also, when it comes to running the business and the financial acumen of things, we are, like I said earlier, but, you know, a technology company and a market-driven company. Um, and if anyone follows us, follows us on 
any of our social media channels, you'll, you'll get an understanding of kind of how we like to speak to you. Um, we speak from that experiential, um, you know, that, that, cent that centric aspect of our culture to be very experiential. We invite you to come and experience the Levante brand. We never force you to do it. We never say, come out. We have the best beer in the world because we know we're not, you're not listening to that. The audience is tone deaf to that. So we put inspiring pictures of who we are, what we do, how we do it, but most importantly, why. And we think that makes a really broad connection to the, uh, the local and, and regional and even national beer community. We question that? <laughs> So, um, a lot of you um, may have remembered that uh, um, we had a uh, we had a beer garden uh, down the street called Levante Stables. Anybody hear of it? Raise your hand. It was uh, an interesting uh, foray into our second location. I mean, our first location is obviously in Westchester. It's on Carter Drive. It's next to Westchester University right off of 202 and Matlack. Um, it's our production facility. It's our very first tap room. But just recently, we thought we'd give it another go. And we have partnered with Highland Orchards. And in two weeks, we're going to open our second iteration of uh, the Levante Beer Garden experience at Highland Orchards over in Westchester um, on uh, Memorial Day. So it'll be open, what, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. It's got a bunch of beers and food trucks and all kinds of cool things. And um, it's, it's basically another community experience and a great partnership with Highland Orchards, who is obviously local and fresh and, uh, and community driven just like us. So we feel like the philosophies are very aligned and we're really looking forward to firing that thing up in a couple of weeks. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Thank you, Jim. And well, Jim already had, uh, had mentioned that our hot party is coming up this weekend and uh, did an amazing job talking about why we are who we are and why we do what we do. Um, something that's extremely important to me is uh, a, a few years, well, when we started, what, four years ago, and we were talking about having an anniversary party, uh, it was very, uh, it was very selfish to, for, to us to think of, oh, we're, we're a year in business now and come out and celebrate us. And I was sitting down with a gentleman who works in our tap room, um, Bernie, and some of you may know him if you've been out to the tap room, amazing guy. He's involved in, uh, he's involved with the Chester County Food Bank or a subsidiary of them. And he said, you know what, Tim, your anniversary is over the summer. And it just so happens that, um, you know, we at the food bank have a really tough time getting donations over the summer because there are no food drives. Uh, you know, school is out of session. Everyone's away on vacation and they're just thinking about enjoying the summer. And no one's thinking about, um, you know, those are in, who are in need or the working poor, as I call them. And I had learned that there are people just like me who have a job or have a business uh, and maybe their spouse passed away or maybe, uh, you know, they reached difficult times or had an injury in the family or a loss. And even though they're working hard and, you know, the money's coming in, it's not enough. So uh, the Chester County Food Bank gets more people than you would believe uh, that are your next door neighbor that just need food for the week or need it for the month or need it for the whole summer. Uh, and I honestly, I'm not, a, I'm not a big crier, but I shed, I shed a little tear to think that there are kids in our own neighborhood that can't eat over the summer. And I just thought, you know, I'm you know, obviously thinking about our anniversary and celebrating us. Why don't we just why don't we still do that? Celebrate us, but why don't we do something? Like you see uh, the woman there who uh, is an amazing person who runs the Chester County Food Bank sitting on an entire pallet full of food that was collected uh, during our, our hot party. What is that? This I think our second year of, of operating it. So, uh, you know, not to plug what we're doing, but uh, it's, it's super important to help the community. If you guys are available this Saturday or even you know, any time this week to drop off some food, we would... Uh, we would, us and the food bank and those in need in the area would very much appreciate it and it would help make for a better summer for everybody. Um, and of course, we'd like to just open everything up to questions. I know we talk for a while, we like to talk, but uh, love to hear what you guys think of the brand or wanna know about beer in general or starting a brewery. Uh, yeah, any, que any questions at all? Um, we'll open it up, just raise your hand if you have any. And then if not, maybe we'll just all drink a beer together afterwards. <laughs> Anybody? 
We answered them all. Awesome. Damn, we, oh, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I have a question, but I just want to tell you, we live out just up the street from where the stables were, and we miss you. Oh, thank you so much. We miss you guys, too. And hopefully we're close enough in, uh, at Highland Orchards that you can come visit us. I grew up down the street. I walked there. I went to school with the Hodges, and you guys are awesome. I can't wait to see you Awesome. Thank you so much. We're excited to see you out there. Maybe pick some strawberries in a couple weeks. <laughs> and there was someone in the back that had a question? Yeah, I just wondered, with the coffee, I'm sure you make a small batch first to try it out. Uh, how difficult is that to ramp up to a big batch? And does that always work out you know, when you ramp it up? I've gotten uh, <laughs> more bold as we've gotten older. Um, we... Uh, <laughs> We, uh, we started on a pilot, so when I started at the brewery, we started on a one barrel because the production system had some problems uh, getting started uh, mechanically. So Tim taught me on the one barrel, and that's you know, where we piloted a lot of stuff. Um, we were lucky enough, I think it was funny, our first coffee beer came out of, uh, our, our first really, really successful kind of collaborative in inspirational coffee beer came out of uh, uh, from out of uh, Grand Cafe L'Aquila, which is in Philadelphia, and um, the coffee roaster there was a uh, beer maker, beer maker in Italy, um, and he just said, "Throw it in the mash," and we're like, "How much?" And he's like, "Oh, yeah, I think we doubled whatever he said um, to <laughs> to the uh, to the bane of the profitability of the beer." But um, so we kind of on that beer just just kind of threw it in. Um, I had been, you know, we had been as a group, I think that was probably three years in and, you know, again, going back to that balancing thing, you know, you get to a certain place where you kind of have that confidence that, you know what, we've done beers, we've done stouts, we've done maybe a coffee stout before. Yeah. We're going to add, you know, coconut, um, and, and a new coffee. Um, but I think this will work. And, um, you know, the, the cool thing about the craft beer industry is that people, customers are always willing to try things. Um, not that we're intentionally trying to make a bad beer. You know, I wouldn't make it if we thought it was going to be bad. But, you know, it's going to be interesting. I think it's almost going to tell a story of, you know, either the beer or the ingredient, um, you know, a as you're doing it. So we kind of look, you know, it's kind of exciting. Uh, it's kind of nerve wracking. There's definitely been some beers where, you know, maybe I shouldn't have, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, took that big of a risk, um, you know, but with those, you know, I had a sense, you know, it's one of those, I had a sense where these are perfect ingredients, maybe, you know, is an innate kind of inspiration, you know, kind of light where you're just like, this, this might work, so, um, but there are definitely times where, uh, I'm trying to think of a, be oh, <laughs> so, so, the best and worst beer we ever made, and one of two beers that made it on to like, again, it was just some guy's list on philly.com, but I always tell that to Jim because he gives me crap for this beer I made, uh, was this beer called Sausage Lemonade. And I intentionally made it sound kind of gross because it was weird. Um, but um, it was, my brother lived in Tucson. There's this beautiful single malt distillery out there uh, called uh, Hamilton Distilleries, but the, the, the whiskey brand was called Whiskey Delback. And they malt and smoke their malt uh, um, in-house over mesquite wood. It was the most interesting and one of the best whiskeys I ever had. I asked my brother to bring back mesquite smoked barley. We did it. You know, he brought a 55 pound bag. We were doing a two barrel. I wanted to make this Polish Grotsky. I was like, I don't, I'm not going to do anything with the rest of this malt. So let's just use all of it. Ended up being 50% mesquite smoked uh, malt. And luckily we did it on the one barrel because it took us about four or five months to sell the whole thing. Having said that, going back to it smelled up the whole brewery, um, and uh, and it was awesome. Though I drank it for every Eagles game that 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 uh, that year. It wasn't the Super Bowl year, so it's not that lucky. But um, but it was a beautiful beer, and it was funny the cult following that came along with it because it actually did end up on you know one of the Philly.com writers like best 25 of the year. And on top of that, about nine spots was our Cloudy and Cumbersome, which is our flagship. So. You know, but it was it was funny because you'd have people come in and and Jim at the time was, you know, I think would ask consumer or customers when they ordered a pint of it. Let's just make sure you try this before you buy a pint of this beer. And again, we had a lot of people kind of searching for it. So on those senses, there are certain things, you know, hey, let's 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 try a pilot this before we put it into 30 kegs or so. <laughs> 
Did anyone have any questions about the movie too? Because I mean, a lot of that resonated with us as well. So, yeah. Uh, you just gave an example of a, an unusual flavor you used that maybe wasn't so successful. What's a really exotic or unusual flavor you've used that has been a big success? Yeah, uh, exotic. I think. Yeah, I mean my. You know, I don't know. I mean, exotic as in, you know, this one's exotic as in I, you know, I don't think we eat this fruit uh, very often, but it, I, one of my favorite ingredients now to use uh, is guava. Um, and again, I don't spend a whole lot of time um, consuming, consuming guava, but, you know, when I tasted it initially, I was like, this is meant for beer. Like, it's just meant for IPAs or a sour beer. It's tart. It's got an aromatic property. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, but that's one of those where the fruit was perfect, but it was kind of weird. I hadn't seen it really in anything. I think I saw it in one other IPA. Um, but then probably, again, another polarizing, but much better, much more successful and unique was, I was I'm obsessed with beets uh, at a certain time of the year. So I just love the beautiful, earthy nature and sweet nature uh, to them. So I, uh, I wanted to make a, um, a beet beer. Um, and, you know, I was gonna do red beets, but I just had a meal, I think, um, in the city with some golden beets. So I found some golden beets. Luckily, we have this awesome little um, market called Artisan Exchange, kind of like a mini Reading Terminal market that opens up on Saturday. It's next door and we can rent their kitchen space. So I spent all day on a busy day, and I think Tim wanted to kill me because I spent all day over there on my computer roasting, skinning golden beets for a, a one barrel. Um, and we put it into a, I use it in a Saison because again, I kind of, when I think of a funky ingredient, sometimes I kind of lazily harken back to Saisons because they have so much complex flavor to them and can provide it. But um, the beet was perfect. It was a beautiful beer. Um, it's one of my favorites we've made, and thank you for reminding me about it, because we'll do it again. Um, but uh, yeah, it just it, that was a that was a unique beer that I had. You know, I hadn't had one until the week prior, and we were up at Hidden River Brewing Company. If if y'all have never been there, it's in Douglasville near Pottstown. Some of the best beers uh, that I've had. They did a, a beer to guard with beets with red beets, and I was just obsessed with it. So um, came home, did that. But that was a, that was a fun ingredient. Standing in that garage with just you know a table in front of you and a few chairs, and you were giving out the beer in those little uh, tasters, three tastes for eight dollars or something like that. I remember that. it well, yeah. And um, I just think about that very fondly. And um, was thinking, uh, how do you, when you look back on that, um, would you ever have imagined and envisioned what Levante has become? Um, just over such a short period of time? Oh, man, that is, uh, it's tough. It's a loaded question you ask because uh, you, where we are, I want to say you try not to look back. You try to always, as at least us, we try to always look forward in the ingredients we use in, uh, in the products that we're putting out. Um, we have things coming out that, that aren't even beer now. Uh, we have things coming out uh, in the near future that aren't even beverages. Uh, so it's, it's pretty exciting. And I'm sure we could talk about them a little bit tonight if you guys have time, but also in the future. But I look back sometimes and I just say, wow, you know, the, the stuff that we've been through uh, and you guys have seen it, you know, there have been, you've been with us, you know, through good times and bad times uh, for everything from the township shutting us down one, one rainy afternoon uh, because we had too many people inside and we have a tent we had a tent put up right next to the building, which I didn't know was illegal, but apparently illegal enough to get shut down. Uh, and to uh, you know, you know, disputes with uh, you know disputes with neighbors and and people within our company, and we, and, and everything comes full circle. And you look back and you say it was kind of meant to be. So uh, here we are, you know, super passionate, more passionate than I think than we ever were about what we do. But it's not just beer now. It's it's business. It's beer. It's the people that and the communities that we serve. And it's just so much bigger. So thank you so much for asking that. I think that, uh, no, I would have never thought that. And uh, in fact, uh, shout out, uh, Cindy is here, who was my boss at my job that I, uh, that I left to start the brewery. 
and uh, she so graciously would, she would walk by my, my cubicle and see me on the computer prepping to, to open the brewery and just say, oh, he's busy, I'll, I'll leave him alone for a little while, you know? Um, and uh, it's just like the movie, I mean, she knows how much I made before starting the brewery and the struggles we had to go through to leave our jobs and to, uh, to go through all that stuff. So yeah, very difficult journey, but I wouldn't trade any of it at all uh, for the world. I'm, and seriously, not just saying that, I think we're, we're so happy to be where we are. So thank you for asking that. It's a good trip down memory lane, the good and the bad. <laughs> Anybody else with, uh, with any questions? Yes, Frank. That's an awesome question. So much has uh, so much has changed in the brewing industry. Just even I would say over the past five years, uh, you have the Pink Boots Society, which is a um, which is a group of uh, female brewers, brewmasters, uh, and just brewery employees in general, uh, brewery owners. That is very very strong, um, you know, in our community and in the brewing community in general. In fact, uh, every year we do one or two collaborations with them. This year we did a, uh, a, a it was Pink Diva which was one of our uh, fruit fetish beers. It's a sour uh, that is just super pink and fabulous and just to, to, to celebrate uh, the women that work for us, but also the women we know in the industry that have helped us to you know, be who we are now. And uh, it is, I think that that was a problem for a long time. It was definitely a male dominated industry and that's changing big time. I mean, uh, especially on the service end, uh, like right now uh, we have Sky Sullivan, who's our uh, tap room or retail manager. Nobody messes with her. She brings on the most effective employees in the world and just runs such a tight ship that I couldn't imagine it being any other way. And uh, you know, to think that it was so male dominated before is uh, very interesting because there's just so much, I mean, there's so many brewery owners uh, and operators that have been effective, um, it goes beyond, you know. It goes, it goes beyond you know, gender diversity too. I mean, our, our our tap room and our and our brew team have you know a variety of of diversity in it. We have um, it's funny these guys were trying to sell you that they're like old guys now and they're what twenty nine thirty one years old. <laughs> I'm up here. I'm you know I think I'm half a century. It's what they tell me on the birth certificate when I calculate it, but I don't feel it. Um, and we have um, we have folks that are you know from early 20s to well well into their 60s and yeah close to 70 and 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 that and you know the gender uh the gender uh, diversity that we have and and racial and cultural diversity that we have too it's important to us um it just makes for a stronger and a and a better team yeah awesome question though i mean there's definitely moves being made uh in the brewing culture for for diversity and it's it's very important any other questions? And you guys are dying to know what non-beverage things that we're coming out with, but we can't share that yet. <laughs> we do, well, we hope, well, thank you so much guys for being here tonight with us and thanks for staying for the extra time and we appreciate you guys so much. If you have time to come out this weekend, we'd love to see you. If not, just be sure to drop by the brewery and, uh, and drop a few items, you know, you know, five to 10 non-perishable items would be great per person yeah. <laughs> but thank you so much and uh yeah round of applause for you guys for sitting through this what 10 hour presentation here so <laughs> thank you